In at number 5 we have Puchin, the Puchin hail from southern Chile and is a creature from Mapuche mythology and Chilotl mythology. The Puchin is described as a shape shifting creature, highly feared, that can instantly change into animal form wherever it so desires. Throughout different stories it has often been described as a gigantic flying snake which produces strange whistling sounds, while its gaze could paralyze any victim it chooses, kind of like Medusa in that way, and permit it to suck its blood. In Chile the word Puchin also designates to the common vampire bat. So some cryptozoologists believe that common vampire bat is the origin of the legend. However, some believe that the puchin could be related to the chupacabra, something we'll be discussing later on. Spoiler alert. It is said that the only people who can defeat the puchin are machi mapuche medicine women. That was a mouthful. In at number 4 we have duendes. A duende for those who don't know is a creature from South America that originated from the phrase possessor of a house and was originally conceptualized as a mischievous spirit inhabiting a home. Now duendes appear to pop up in many cultures around the world. In Portugal the word is used to describe beings of a small stature wearing big hats whistling a mystical song while walking in the forest. It is said that they lure young girls and boys to the forest causing them to lose their way home. However in Latin America this differs slightly, duendes are believed to be the helpers of people who got lost in the forest so they could find their way home. They are also known to be gnome like creatures who live inside the walls of homes, especially the bedroom walls of young children. As you can tell the legend differs from region to region, some believing they are the souls of infants who died before they could be baptised. Others simply portray them as malevolent spirits that hide in homes and wreak havoc. Regardless of that, they are nasty little suckers who cause problems wherever they go. Coming in at number 3 we've got the last bus. In the same way that fears related to water and adultery cut across all cultures, it seems that late night public transit has a similar legacy, and really, why wouldn't it? Being in an enclosed space that is difficult to immediately exit late at night, traversing potentially unfamiliar terrain is fertile ground for horrifying happenings. And just such a happening makes up the bones of this urban legend. In the mid 90s, a bus was heading to Beijing's Fragrant Hills. As it trucked along, two men attempted to flag it down. This was odd, considering that they were not at a bus stop, but the driver was feeling generous that day. Turns out there were three men, two of which wore traditional ancient robes and one more who was being held up by the other two. As the bus rolled along, it slowly emptied until there were only two passengers left, not counting the three latecomers. A young man and an old woman both sat there, looking at these pale passengers. Suddenly, the old woman accused the young man of stealing her wallet and demand that the bus driver let them off so they could take this matter to the police. When they got off, the man was furious. Not only had she falsely accused him of committing a crime, she had also had them get off in the middle of nowhere. Not even a police station was nearby. However, she had a good reason to cry wolf. She'd noticed something nobody else had. The three men had no legs. They'd been floating at the height of standing men and therefore must have been ghosts. Who knows what might have happened if they'd stayed on that late night bus with the three phantoms. Coming in at number 2, we've got Single Braid Road. What could be a reference to the shape of the road is actually a morbid description of a terrible death that supposedly occurred here. Let this be a lesson to you all. Don't jump from trains. Okay, I'll explain. Way back when, it said that there was a young couple. The man had all of his paperwork sorted out, but the woman did not. She, being an illegal immigrant, was living a life a little on the edge. Part way through the journey, some police officers boarded the train in order to check everyone's passports and such. Realizing this would not end well for her, the young woman decided to hop off the train. Unfortunately, she had done her hair in a very structurally sound style that day, a single long braid. When she jumped out, her hair got caught in the window, ripping her scalp from her head and taking her face along with it. After having most of the skin on her head removed, she crawled her way to Single Braid Road and died there. Gruesome, right? Well, the story doesn't end there. Apparently, if you head down Single Braid Road, you might come across a young woman with a long braid. Only men can see her, supposedly. If you approach her, she'll turn towards you and reveal that she lacks any facial features. I'll leave you to imagine what might happen next. And finally, at number one, we've got the Suicide Shopping Center. Look, I get it. Sometimes malls make me want to hop over the guardrail and into the fountain below. We've all been there. However, so many self-inflicted deaths have occurred at this shopping center, folks are starting to get suspicious. Since it opened in 2004, over a dozen folks have committed suicide outside of Liwan Plaza. 
Some say there's a mysterious presence that might give the unfortunate souls a little push. These claims are backed up by a variety of strange discoveries that occurred during the building of said plaza. See, while they were developing the land, eight empty coffins were discovered buried below. They did their best to work around this seemingly cursed discovery, first by constructing the building to appear octagonal and then by contacting a Taoist priest. When the holy man arrived, he let the others know that the coffins were meant to prevent evil from spreading in that area. The thing is, the coffins can't do that job if they're removed in the process of building a shopping center. Uh-oh. Seems that these strange noises and unfortunate deaths tended to drive customers away. It's too bad, isn't it? Coming in at number 5, we have the Expressionless. According to this very bizarre legend, a nameless woman arrived at the Cedar sinai Hospital back in June of 1972, wearing a bloodied white gown. Now what set this woman apart from the rest of the patients in the hospital was that she had a mannequin-like appearance, yet moved fluently like any normal person. Her face was devoid of facial features, and on top of all of that, the woman had a kitten inside of her mouth, which she pulled out before collapsing to the ground. Now she was quickly rushed into a room and prepped for sedation, with the staff opting to restrain her just in case. However, when they attempted to inject her, the woman immediately fought back. She then rose from the bed and revealed razor sharp teeth that were seemingly impossible to fit into her mouth. She then attacked one of the doctors, sinking her teeth firmly into his neck, killing him quickly. When authorities arrived, they couldn't restrain her, with the woman killing everyone in the hospital, with only one nurse surviving the onslaught, dubbing the woman the expressionless. Since that day, there has never been a sighting of her, perhaps because she isn't real. What I don't understand is is why she had a kitten in her mouth that is the most bizarre part of the entire thing. Now the origin behind this legend, it was uploaded on the internet appearing on Creepypasta back in June of 2012. Coming in at number 4, we have Lavender Town Syndrome. This is a popular urban legend amongst gamers, specifically those who played Pokemon Red and Green in Japan. This legend began back in 1996, when there was an apparent peak in suicides and sickness in folks between the ages of 7 to 12 years old. Rumours began to spread that illness occurred in children who reached Lavender Town in Pokemon, with it being said that the town's theme music had extremely high pitched frequencies that may have resulted in folks becoming sick or even taking their own lives. Due to this frequency, it is said that around 200 people took their own lives or developed illnesses and afflictions, with some complaining of severe headaches after listening to the music. The mass hysteria ultimately resulted in the programmers fixing the music to be at a lower frequency, and since then no complaints have been made. In Pokemon Gold, Silver and Crystal, the Lavender Town music was recomposed altogether to be happier, and the Pokemon Tower was demolished and replaced with the Kanto Radio Tower. The Lavender Town theme was also re-recorded for the 2017 Pokemon Go Halloween event. Coming in at number 3, El Chupacabra. Also known as the Chupacabra, this is a goat sucker, a legendary creature that was first reported back in the mid 90s. The name itself comes from the animal's reported habit of attacking and drinking the blood of livestock, including goats. Now, there is actually said to be two kinds of Chupacabra. One is a reptilian kind, the true Chupacabra, and a canine kind, who are also called blue dogs. The first known sightings and attacks occurred back in March of 1995 in Puerto Rico. Eight sheep were found dead, each strained of blood. Investigators found three strange puncture wounds in the chest of the animal. A few months later in August, an eyewitness, Madeline Tolentino, reported seeing the creature in the town of Canovanas, when as many as 150 farm animals and pets were reportedly killed by the creature. Jumping forward to 1975, similar killings in the town of Mocha were attributed to the vampire of Mocha. It was initially believed that these acts were committed by a satanic cult, but later more killings were reported around the island, and many farms reported reported loss of animal life. Each of the animals were reported to have had their body bled dry through a series of small incisions. Now, like I mentioned before, the most common description of the chupacabra is that of a reptile-like creature, said to have leathery or scaly greenish grey skin, and sharp spines or quills running down its back. The other popular description is that of a strange breed of wild dog. It is described as being hairless and has a pronounced spinal ridge, unusually pronounced eye sockets, fangs, and even claws. In at number 2, La Llorona. Hailing from Hispanic folklore, La Llorona, which I'm pronouncing correctly now after you guys yelled at me in a previous video, is also known as the Wailing Woman or even the Crier. This is a legend about a woman who drowned her children in a lake and now mourns their deaths for eternity, roaming South America as a ghost or apparition. The story itself goes as follows. The woman was unloved by her husband and one day she caught him with another woman. So as revenge, she drowned her sons in a river. In grief, 
grief and anger, and then drowned herself after she realised what she did. She was ultimately refused entry into heaven, for obvious reasons, unless she found the souls of her two sons. So now legend states that she roams the earth, hunting for the souls of her sons, with her cries and wails luring in innocent victims. Lyarona kidnaps wandering children at night, mistaking them for her own. Folks who have claimed to have seen her say that she appears at night or in the late evening by rivers or lakes, wearing a white gown with a veil. And some believe that if you hear the cries of Lyarona, you are marked for death. Now, one particular encounter went as follows. A boy and his family were sitting near a creek between Mora and Guadalapita in New Mexico when they saw the form of a tall, thin woman. She seemed to float over the water and end up the hill out of sight until returning a little later closer to them. The family had suspicions that she was La Llorona, so they went to the shore to see if there were footprints, and there were none. Creepy stuff. More interesting still, the earliest reference to La Llorona was actually in a sonnet written by Mexican poet Manuel Carpio in the late 1800s, where he identifies her as the ghost of a woman who was drowned by her husband. And finally, coming in at number one, we have El Silbon. Hailing from Colombia as well as Venezuela, El Saban, also known as the Whistler, is a legendary figure described as a lost soul. This tale originated in the 19th century, with the Whistler being described as the harbinger of death. According to the legend, a son kills his father after he returns home to find his father attacking his mother. This angered the boy, resulting in him killing his father. Another version is a tad more disconcerting and states that the son was a spoiled brat, and on one afternoon he demanded that his father hunt for a deer, his favourite meal. However, when his father did not find any deer and instead returned empty handed, his son killed him and cut out his heart, cooking them for dinner. Following this, the mother grabbed the boy's grandfather, who then tied the boy to a tree and unleashed a vicious dog on him. As this was happening, his mother put a curse on the boy, which ultimately condemned him to wander the plains as a ghost, carrying a sack of bones on his back. Some versions of the story state that these bones are of his father, while others state that these are the bones of his victims. Now, the whistler is said to have a characteristic whistle that resembles the musical note C, D, E, F, G, A, B in that order. It is said that when the whistling sounds close, there's no danger, but if the whistling is far away, it means the whistler is nearby. Very confusing, I know. It is also stated that hearing the whistler foretells one's own death, and in this situation, the only thing that can save the victims is the sound of a barking dog. Many people from Venezuela have said that they have spotted the whistler primarily in the summer. However, it is mainly on rainy days that the whistler wanders, hungry for death and eager to punish drunkards, womanizers, or even innocent victims. It is said that the whistler will suck the alcohol out of drunkards through their navel when it finds them alone, and it tears womanizers to pieces, removes their bones, and puts them in the sack where it keeps the remains of its father. Lovely stuff. Coming in at number five, we have the Night Marchers. The Huaca Ipo, also known as the Night Marchers, are murderous shades, demons, and revenants that haunt the islands. These undead spirits are the fighters, heroes, and warriors of ancient Hawaii, who are well known throughout the Hawaiian legends. These warriors are believed to be eternally fated to march the islands, seeking their next battle. They're most active at night, but also have been reported to be seen during the day. No structure deters their path, and as a result, Result, they're often seen walking right through buildings. Some think that these restless souls are looking to reclaim rightful territory, replay a battle gone awry, or avenge their own deaths. While others say that night marchers are searching methodically for an entrance into the next world. Night marchers are said to roam through very specific locations and are often recognized by their raised torches and repeated chants, although there have been a few scattered reports of daytime marches. Moreover, the night marchers are thought to come out during periods of heavy wind, rain and high surf, and fog or mist often accompanies them on their journey. It is also thought that the night marchers appear on certain nights designated by the moon, including Poakua, the 14th night of the new moon, and the nights of Cain, Ku, Lono, and Kanaloa. Although the night marchers allegedly float a few inches off the ground, some local accounts tell of seeing mysterious footprints in their path after they have passed. But where there was legend has it that resting your eyes upon the night marchers could signal a grim fate for the perpetrator, a friend or a relative, so witnesses are urged to crouch low to the ground, freeze and don't look into their eyes. Any sound or movement could invite a night marcher's deadly glance. These night marchers are set diligently upon their destination and are not considered spirits that will deviate from their path to haunt humans nearby. Therefore you must also be perfectly silent and still, for any sudden sound or movement could invite the deadly glance of a night marcher. If you make eye contact with the night marchers, you will die 
and be forced to march with them for an eternity. Coming in at number 4 we have Haunted Pei Highway. Pei Highway is known as a historic site and urban legend attached to it. The highway runs through the district of Nuuanu, a valley between the Koalau mountain range on leeward Oahu and it was there that this decisive battle unfolded. Hundreds of warriors fought in the battle. Years later during the initial development and what would eventually become the Pali Highway more than 800 human remains were recovered. Some believe that the spirits of those warriors continue to haunt the area. Pali Highway is a staple of local urban legends and a popular spot for paranormal activity. People report coming back with photos of orbs or white mist or stories of supernatural encounters. One of the most common stories associated with the highway warns people not to take pork over the Pali. This is because it is known that if you try to bring pork across your car will stop at some point along the journey and an old woman with a dog will appear. To continue on your way you must feed the pork to the dog. While another story about the area describes two large stones at the start of the Pali Trail. These stones according to the legends were considered goddesses who took the form of these stone sentries to guard the Pali. Travellers would leave offerings in exchange for safe passage and women would bury the umbilical cords of their newborns as protection from evil spirits. In at number 3 we have the disappearance of Ashley Kansas. Now this is a bizarre urban legend but one of my favourites on this entire list. It is said that back in 1952 an anomalous incident occurred in the town of Ashley, Kansas. However it should be noted that this isn't nor has ever been a real place. Sorry to burst your bubble. However the legend states that back in 1952 an earthquake occurred in the middle of the night resulting in strange happenings. Specifically the town of Ashley, Kansas abruptly disappearing. When police went to investigate they found nothing only a smouldering burning fissure. It was said that the 679 residents of the town were missing, however the search for them was called off after 12 days of searching. The legend also goes on to state that not long after, yet another earthquake occurred. And this time when the police went to investigate, the burning fissure was gone and the town was still nowhere to be seen. And that is all that is known about Ashley, Kansas, the town that supposedly disappeared overnight. Coming in at number 2 we have Slenderman. To quote the original Slenderman post on something awful, We didn't want to go, we didn't want to kill them, but its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. This is perhaps the most popular modern day legend on our list, with it crossing over into the mainstream with games and movies being made about this supernatural figure. Now Slenderman originated as a creepypasta internet meme created by Something Awful forums user Eric Knudsen back in 2009. Slender is described as being incredibly tall, somewhere between 7 to 9 feet, as well as pale in complexion with an emaciated figure. He is sometimes portrayed with incomplete features such as empty eye sockets. He is also said to possess a handful of supernatural natural powers and abilities. He is said to be immortal having lived for around 11,000 years without end and any wounds inflicted on him instantly heal. Now stories told about the supernatural character commonly feature him stalking, abducting or traumatizing children. Now outside of the internet he has become an icon with a prominent influence in popular culture with video games being made about the figure including Slender the 8 pages and Slender the arrival. However things became very real with this legend back in 2014 when two girls attacked another girl and claimed to the courts that they did it for Slenderman, which is absolutely terrifying. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the Russian sleep experiment. This urban legend emerged a few years back in 2010, so sorry to disappoint in advance, but this one is certainly not real, but that doesn't stop folks from speculating. Now, the legend itself recounts a supposed experiment that took place in the late 1940s in a Soviet test facility. According to the legend, five prisoners were kept in a sealed gas chamber with a continually administered air airborne stimulant which kept them awake for 30 consecutive days. Now the prisoners volunteered for the experiment under the false promise that they would be released after the 30 days. For the first few days of the experiment the prisoners behaved normally, chatting with one another and even talking to researchers through the one way glass. However over the subsequent days things quickly turned much darker. After 9 days one of the prisoners began screaming uncontrollably for hours on end, while the other prisoner seemingly had no reaction to the odd outburst. The man ultimately screamed for so long that his vocal cords burst, which makes me feel physically sick. I know this isn't real, but the idea of that happening is disgusting. Not long after, a second prisoner began screaming, while the others prevented the researchers from looking in by pasting torn book pages to the windows with their own feces. A few more days passed and things went silent, and after 15 days, the researchers decided to turn off the stimulant and enter the room, 
What they found was absolutely disgusting. One of the prisoners was deceased and the four remaining survivors had performed severe mutilation on themselves, tearing off their own flesh and removing their own organs. Coming in at number 5, we've got the Magallan Monster. If you've ever taken a drive up the 87, you might have come across a set of very colorful, very large footprints tracked across the highway. While these particular prints were put there by people, they are in homage to the Magallan Monster, aka Arizona's answer to Bigfoot. This big beastie lives along the Magallan Rim and has been seen from Prescott all the way to Clifton. Sightings of the monster date back to early as 1903, with plenty of reports of video, tracks, and hair samples appearing since. People claim that the Magallan Monster is a bipedal humanoid towering over most at 7 feet tall, leaving behind 22 inch footprints. Like most ape-like beasts in the woods, it has crazy strength and some wild eyes. Some claim it's covered in long black hair, others say it's reddish brown. Maybe it changes with the seasons, or maybe there's more than one. The Magallan monster is also known for smelling really, really bad. Like dead fish, skunk, B.O., peat moss, and snapping turtle musk. I'd hide out in the woods if I smelled like that too. Part of the reason why it's so rarely sighted is that it tends to be active at night. It will hunt and gather all sorts of different foods under cover of darkness and make little nests for itself. You stumble across one of these pine needle refuges, get the hell out of there. This beefy monster is known to be very territorial and very violent. It reportedly likes to decapitate deer and other wildlife before digging in, and if it can pull the dome off a deer, it can pop your top off like a bottle of coke. Be careful if you hear any weird noises too, because the Magallan monster likes to mimic other wildlife. Birds, coyotes, it is even reported to shriek like a woman in distress. So don't go running off to save the damsel because you might find yourself face to face with a very hairy hunter. Tie up your supplies if you're camping too, as the monster will rummage through stuff left out. You know, they were all about the hairy man or the wild man or something like that. And of course I didn't believe them. This, says Wade, is a small baby Bigfoot trying to hide in the corner from his night vision camera. Coming in at number four, we've got El Chupacabra. Ah, the Southwest classic. Such a strange creature, the Chupacabra. Is it an alien? A demon dog? Something else? Also known as the goat sucker, these cryptids love to feed on livestock, attacking in the night. Farmers and other animal owners have often found these creatures totally hollowed out following particularly dark nights. Common features of the Chupacabra attacks are a complete lack of blood and puncture wounds in the neck and hindquarters. The wounds are always super clean, no signs of struggle or messiness. Sometimes there are weird injuries too. Cattles often have their anuses cored out and somehow even with these brutal injuries no blood is found. Do the goat suckers inject some sort of sedative? Do they have magical powers? We may never know. One theory is that they have wings and descend on their prey and drain them before they have time to react. This would also explain the lack of tracks that accompany chupacabra attacks. Although if they were so quick and clever, wouldn't they also attack humans? Maybe our blood just doesn't taste as good. Now, this legend didn't start in Arizona, but now it's quite prevalent. El Chupacabra seems to have originated in Puerto Rico and made its way into Latin America, eventually spreading to the southwestern states. Now you'd be hard pressed to find an Arizonan without some sort of Chupacabra story. Tucson resident Billy Nubian claims that he saw one attacking his goats late one night. He was startled awake by the panic sounds of his goats bleeding. Running outside to investigate, he saw a huge rat-like creature pinning one of his goats. It then turned to face Billy, let out a blood-curdling scream, and ran off into the dark. Sarah A has a similar story where she encountered a half-man, half-ape creature crouching frog-style in her yard. Freaky. In at number three, we have the Menehune. According to Hawaiian oral traditions, the Menehune were an ancient race of Polynesian people who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands before the first voyages arrived. While there are no written accounts or skeletal remains of the Menehune, many Hawaiian legends reference them as mythical people of small stature and great strength. According to mythology, Menehune lived deep in the forests of Kauai and other Hawaiian islands. The Menehune are a mischievous group of small people who roamed the deep forest at night and are said to be about two feet tall, though some were as tiny as 6 inches, small enough to fit in the palm of a hand. They enjoy dancing, singing and archery, and their favourite foods are bananas and fish. According to local legend, these small creatures are extremely industrious, master builders who are able to use their massive strength to accomplish great feats of construction and engineering in a matter of hours. The Menehune worked at night so ancient Hawaiians would not discover them. Their work would be abandoned if they were caught. Legend has it that the Menehune were capable of completing major projects in a single night. 
Hawaii, and they are credited with the construction of the Elacoco fish pond. Though referred to as the Menahune fish pond, archaeologists believe the site was constructed 1,000 years ago, and that the stones used in its construction came from more than 25 miles away. If not credited to be built by the Menahune, its construction is a mystery. Another structure with mysterious Menahue ties on Kauai is the Kikiola Irrigation Ditch, located in Waimea. While ancient Hawaiians are known for their stone crafted irrigation systems for growing taro, the Menahune Ditch is a fascinating archaeological find because of the type and cut of stone used to create it. Instead of uncut or roughly shaped lava rock, the Menahune Ditch is constructed of finely carved basalt stones. In addition to their handiwork, the Menahune have been known to use magic arrows to pierce the heart of angry people, igniting feelings of love instead. They also enjoy cliff diving, and according to local lore, they were smart, extremely strong, and excellent craftsmen, though because they worked at night, they were rarely seen by human eyes. Coming in at number two, we have the Green Lady. By day, the Wahiawa Botanical Garden is a beautiful destination for those wanting to see lush tropical flora. Nearby, however, is home to a legend of a much more ghastly sight. If you decide to peer down into the nearby gulch at twilight, you may just see a glimpse of the local legendary Obake or Ghost, the Green Lady of Wahiawa. The story of the Green Lady takes place in the Wahiawa Botanical Garden, where one day, while taking a shortcut through the nearby garden, the woman became separated from one of her children in the dense and dark forest. Unable to find her child, she lost her life of heartbreak and disappeared. Now she wanders the area and is said to snatch people that she finds playing in the garden and forest in an attempt to replace her own lost family. Reports of the Green Lady describes her as a monstrous woman with green tinted skin. Her clothing and long black hair are covered in moss and seaweed, and her approach is heralded by the stench of the decaying plant matter that covers her. There have been sightings of a green woman in the forest, and the last known sighting was in the 1980s. People in Wahiawa sometimes dare each other to run across the bridge, as the story says that the Green Lady will come up on the bridge to take people away. The ghost has even been seen on the outskirts of Wahiawa Elementary School, which is located on the edge of the gulch. And finally, in and one, we have Pele's Curse. Moving towards one of the most known urban legends of Hawaii, we have Pele's Curse. Pele is known as the Hawaiian goddess of fire, lightning, wind, dance, and volcanoes. Her home is believed to be on the Halamaumau crater at the summit of the Kalauea volcano. Pele is often portrayed as a wanderer, and sightings of the familiar and popular goddess have been reported throughout the island chain for hundreds of years, but especially near volcanic craters and near the home of Kalauea, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. In these sightings, she appears as a very tall, beautiful young woman, or an unattractive and frail elderly woman, usually accompanied by a white dog. Those well versed in the legend say that Pele takes this form of an elderly beggar woman to test people, asking them if they have food or drink to share. Those who are generous and share with her are rewarded, while anyone who is greedy or unkind is punished with their homes or other valuables destroyed. She is known for her passion and temper, with many visitors reporting hearing stories of her power and destruction. The legend of Pele's curse says that anyone who removes anything natively Hawaiian, like pieces of rock or sand from the Hawaiian islands, will feel the wrath of Pele, who views the rocks as her children. Legend has it that if you take from Pele, you will incur years of bad luck. It is said that Pele's wrath is stimulated by jealousy or arrogance. Some believe the myth of Pele's curse was actually invented by park rangers on the big island of Hawaii because they were tired of visitors making off with bits of the island. Many people, including local residents, believe that Pele's curse is just a legend. However, to this day, hundreds of pieces of lava rock are mailed back to the big island as a result of those who claim they have experienced bad luck and misfortune due to the curse they received when stealing from the island. Coming in at five, Schneider's Alley. Located in Adelaide, Australia, a man known as Dr. Michael Schneider acquired the Clifton Manor in the early 1900s, a mansion located on the 40 acres of land in this picturesque landscape. Who wouldn't be happy? The doctor very quickly moved his wife and two daughters in, and for a brief time, everything was good. Schneider had a cabin on his land that he used to treat patients, however, rumor has it most of his patients were schizophrenic or mentally ill, and he decided to treat them on his secluded land to keep them away from his family. However, in a bizarre turn of events, his wife and two daughters all died due to an unforeseen accident. Schneider went mad, and the cabin was his place of torture, where he would work through his grief. However, it wasn't a healthy outlet, with Schneider using the cabin to perform surgeries without any form of anesthesia. Neighbors even reported hearing screams coming from the property, and rumors very quickly spread throughout the town that the doctor was killing and dismembering his patients as a form of satanic ritual. The cries continued, but no investigation was conducted until the doctor died. The police found Schneider in his home, with the limbs and bodies of his dead family surrounding him. It is now rumored that the mansion 
mansion is haunted by Dr. Schneider and his patients. And for those that enjoy fear, you can explore Schneider's Alley, which is now known as Andrew's Walk. But be warned. Coming at four, bodies in the bridge. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is perhaps one of the most iconic landmarks in Sydney. It's a heritage listed steel through arch bridge that carries rail, vehicles, bicycles, as well as pedestrian traffic between the business districts and the North Shore. However, this bridge houses an incredibly dark secret. It is widely known that the construction of the bridge took eight years to build and resulted in deaths of up to 16 iron workers. These deaths have been recorded in the history books, however, it was not noted that there there were actually far more deaths, with another three workers losing their lives with the government covering up and remaining hush hush about the entire thing. So why exactly did this happen? They were transparent about the 16 lives that were lost, but why not the other three? Well the story goes that the other three construction workers fell into the huge pylons while building was underway, and retrieving their bodies was deemed too difficult and costly, given that the workers were under immense pressure to complete the project. So rather than delay, they instead decided to leave the bodies embedded in the pylons where they supposedly remain to this day. If the myth is true, the Sydney Harbour Bridge is actually one giant burial site. Remember that next time you visit it. Coming in at number 3, we've got Skinwalkers. These Navajo legends have been sighted all over but have quite a reputation in Arizona. Medicine men, possessed by spirits having to choose between good and evil. Often hermits being exiled from their communities. They take the forms of many animals and travel through the wastes. If driving through the arid desert at night wasn't unsettling enough, just wait until you hear about what skinwalkers like to do. Often they'll travel alongside lone vehicles in the dark, even when the car is huffing it. They'll tap on the windows of the vehicle, trying to get the driver's attention. If the driver stops to see what's going on and gets out of their car, it's not likely that they're coming back. Yikes. There are some hot spots that locals try to avoid at night. Apparently there's a ranch that has been given the name Skinwalker Ranch thanks to the huge amounts of reports made, and San Carlos Reservation is also a place most will warn you away from during the night. Although most forests at night have their fair share of spooky denizens. There's one tale of a man camping alone that really makes you question whether a little adventure is worth it or not. He was hiking along with his dog and found an empty cave to set up camp in. As he unpacked his stuff he noticed some unsettling cave paintings along the walls. Later Later that same night, he was woken up by his dog ferociously barking. As he sat up to see what was the matter, he saw a malformed creature slinking near the entrance of the cave. Acting quickly, he shot at it with his rifle, but this only stunned the creature. It called out to him, saying that it wanted to help. Sure. At this point, the man grabbed his dog and hightailed it out of there, leaving all his stuff. He hasn't gone back since. Hopefully he didn't leave anything too valuable behind, although he did escape with his dog and his life, which are valuable enough. Coming in at number two, we've got the Haunted Antique Mall. Back to Tucson for more terror and troubles, there's an old two-story furniture store that was converted into an antique mall of sorts. You know the kind, set up like a flea market with all sorts of independent booths selling their wares. Well, one day customers were walking around upstairs looking at the assorted antiques and they heard some clicking noises. One particularly curious antiquer decided to investigate and found the source, an old typewriter. The thing is, no one was around to operate it. The customers who had heard the typing were the only people upstairs. After that, more and more ghostly tales appeared. Furniture that was left neat and tidy at closing would be strewn throughout the aisles the next morning. Radios would increase in volume with no one around. Employees found themselves frozen in place from time to time, experiencing a distortion of time. They would be stuck there as customers passed by in fast or slow motion. Apparitions would appear all over, sometimes appearing as a grinning boy, other times as a mischievous looking teenager. Nobody knows who these wraiths belong to. After hearing loud crashing noises upstairs but finding nothing displaced, the owners decided it was time to close down the upper level. Now, considering that all sorts of people were bringing in antiques from different sources, it is possible that all these ghosts came from haunted objects. Or it could be that the furniture store itself is haunted. Nobody's come up with concrete proof of the hauntings, but if you ever find yourself antiquing in Tucson, watch out for paranormal activity. And finally at number one, the ghosts of Slaughterhouse Canyon. I mean, the name of this canyon should be enough to give into its bad news. Let me say it again. Slaughterhouse Canyon. Come on. The tale that accompanies the terrifying name comes from the gold rush back in the 1800s. A young family moved out to try their hand at striking it rich. However, this plan did not go very well. Soon they were hungry and destitute. The father would often head out for days searching for food to sustain him and his family. Tragically, one day he never returned. Without the father to keep them fed, the family slowly starved. 
as their bodies wasted away, so too did their minds. Eventually, the mother couldn't take it anymore. Her children's cries were too much for her to bear. She donned her wedding dress and ritualistically killed her children. Carrying the corpses down to the nearby river, she wept and screamed. After she dropped their bodies into the water, she wandered around till succumbing to starvation soon after. This sad story forever marred the reputation of Slaughterhouse Canyon. Now, if you visit at night, you might be able to hear the pained cries of the murderous mad mother. Tragic and terrifying. In at number five, we have Space Mountain. There are a surprising amount of urban legends surrounding this ride at Disney World, which is odd. It is just a ride after all, right? Nothing strange about it. According to legend, one rider was decapitated while on Space Mountain because because he supposedly stood up while riding. What a f***ing idiot. Now this is only a little bit true. There was a decapitation, but it was on a test dummy, not a real person. No person has ever been killed while riding Space Mountain. However, there is another dark legend that surrounds this ride. According to legend, on Space Mountain you can find Mr. One Way. Some accounts describe Mr. One Way as a redhead man with a red face, with stories stating that he hangs out in the line for Space Mountain. But this differs depending on who you ask. According to video footage, Mr. One Way will sometimes get onto the ride with other passengers, grabbing an available seat. However, it is said that he disappears right before you reach the final tunnel at the end of the ride. On top of that, there is supposedly a second ghost called Disco Debbie, who is also said to haunt Space Mountain, and according to some riders, she glows in the dark. Very freaky indeed. Coming in at number 4, we have Magnolia Creek Lake. Magnolia was once a thriving riverport town in southern Wakula County, Florida, which was established all the way back in the 1820s and is now classified as an extinct city by the State Library and Archives of Florida. All that remains of the city is a cemetery, with the last known burial being back in 1859. Magnolia Creek Lane is a narrow road fit for one car at a time south of Montverde on the west side of Lake Apopka. According to legend, the road and surrounding Lake is haunted by around 200 passengers who were killed in a train wreck. However, many have attempted to find evidence of this, but none has ever been found. Yet the legend continues. Now, while the road appears to be built on an old train track, the only documented railroad ran slightly north of the location. Now, this road is supposedly where all kinds of horrible things happened back in the 1890s, and according to some locals at the creek that runs to Lake Apopka, you can hear the loud screams in the woods. However, when you get closer, they move farther away. The screams are said to be that of the train crew that died. However, skeptics believe this is actually sound that is being reflected from another place. According to a local, Michelle, she said, I quote, My cousin went to Montverde Academy and heard about this road that runs off 455 that used to be a railroad bed. And they say that if you go down there at night, you can hear ghostly sounds and see eerie shadows of people walking on the road. I don't know for sure about this because I never went there, so it is just what I heard. Coming in at three, the Satanists of Perth. This may come as a shock to some Australians, but according to many rumours, Perth is home to a thriving community of satanic worshippers. Yeah fun times. According to reports and speculation, these worshippers come together at Kings Park in the dead of night to perform these devilish rituals, with the group drawing strange symbols, burning figures, as well as having wild, non-stop orgies on the grassy slopes of the mound. And of course, once a year, the coven come together and perform a human sacrifice. According to some theorists, the group does this by hunting down and murdering the local homeless as a means to sustain their power with the devil. Coming in at 2, Sydney's subterranean world. Locked away deep under the hustle and bustle of Sydney's major train station lies a network of train platforms, tunnels and tracks that were built in the 1920s but were never operational. This was to be one of the first underground stations in Australia, however the plan to continue work on additional lines was cancelled when the Great Depression struck. The labyrinth of tunnels extends one kilometre in two directions, from St James Station about 30 metres below Hyde Park and past the Cahill Expressway entrance off McCary Street. Now these tunnels lay unused under the streets of Sydney which has over time led to some downright creepy rumours and speculation. A few urban legends have arisen, including that of an albino eel that is said to reside in the St James Tunnel Lake, as well as that the underground level was built by marauding first settlers to aid them in their kidnapping schemes. Now, many urban explorers have gone deep into the tunnels, taking disturbing and unsettling pictures that they've shared online. In one explorer's picture, they captured an unsettling picture of Satan with a skeleton cross and a heart on fire, with them stating that it represents hell. Spooky. Would you dare explore this subterranean world? 
I wouldn't. And finally, coming in at number one, the Burning Airman. Back in 1940, a horrible tragedy struck Canberra when a Lockheed Hudson bomber plane lost control and crashed into the woods. The event was a bizarre occurrence considering it was a sunny and clear day with the plane coming in to land from a normal flight before suddenly just nosediving into a field and bursting into flames. It was a terrible incident that was ultimately dubbed Canberra Air Disaster and went down as one of the most tragic events in Australian history. However, it didn't end there. Years later, reports began to come in from local residents who had strange encounters in the woods, with many of them claiming they saw odd lights near the crash site, and many others claiming that they heard the distant drone of an airplane, followed by a loud bang. However, the most terrifying of them all was a local teenage girl who emerged one night from the woods in a fit of terror, claiming that she had been chased by the dead airman whose spectral body was covered in flames. What was previously a popular makeout spot for kids is now closed, and instead houses a memorial site for the deceased airman. Man. Coming in at number five, we've got the peace picture. I love this story. Honestly, I had no idea that it came from Korea either. When I worked as a camp counselor, I would tell this on night hikes all the time, and let me tell you, it really scared some campers. There are a few different versions with different main characters and different setup scenarios, but the meat and potatoes all pretty much stay the same. Alright, so the legend goes a little something like this. A middle schooler is biking home with his friends and they come to a forest path. Our main character lives through the woods and his pals take a different route home. So the group splits up and the young lad cycles through the trees. As he's going along, something catches his eye. There's a Polaroid picture lying face down at the foot of a tree. He pulls off the path, hops off his bike, and notices that there's a broken bicycle behind the tree. Picking up the photo, he sees a cute girl smiling at the camera, flashing the peace sign. You know the one. He really likes the picture, so he pockets it and heads home. That night, the boy feels an overwhelming urge to look out the window. When he does, he notices a young girl standing in his yard, facing away from him. He calls out to her, but she doesn't react. Feeling strange, he heads downstairs and walks into the yard, but the girl is nowhere to be seen. The next day, he shows his friends the picture and tells them the story of the girl in his yard, but none of them seem to recognize her. They go about their day at school, and then it's time to go home. On the ride home, the boy keeps an eye out for the girl about town, but doesn't see anyone resembling her. He and his friends make it to the woods again and split up. Distracted, the boy pedals his way through the flora and fauna. Suddenly, he catches a glimpse of someone behind a tree and cranes his neck to see if it could be her. Unfortunately, this causes him to lose his focus and crash. He doesn't survive. Weeks later, another kid is wandering through the woods. They see a Polaroid photograph lying in the decomposing leaves. Picking the picture up, they see a really cute girl holding up three fingers. Thinking it's a nice photo, they pocket it and head right along. Creepy, right? There are many variants with car wrecks instead of bike crashes and grown men instead of school children, but the peace sign evolving into a three with another victim stays the same. Coming in at number four, we've got virgin ghosts. It's every frat boy from the 80s worst nightmare, dying a virgin. Apparently this fear crosses cultures too. Known in Korea as the Cho Nyo Guishin, they can be found all over the place. Folks say that you might run into a virgin ghost in abandoned buildings, hospitals, schools, bathrooms, cemeteries, and forests. So basically, anywhere you might have found a living virgin. They are characterized by their long dark hair that completely covers their face, and they're always wearing white clothing. Look behind that hair and you'll notice they look pretty bummed too. I suppose that comes with the title, huh? People say you'll know you're near one when the temperature drops suddenly and the wind changes direction. Chills are a common symptom too, but those kinda come with the previous two. In Confucian Korean culture, it was a woman's role to serve her father, husband, and sons. If someone died before doing these things, she would be cursed to wander the earth forever. So if a woman was to die a virgin, she would become a Cho Nyo Guishin. This comes with a fair deal of bitterness. Often, these ghosts will wander around the place where their former family lived, doing their best to cause problems for their good old relatives. Apparently erecting, pardon the pun, phallic statues could calm an angry virgin ghost down. This doesn't work, or if town council won't approve a long hard statue, you can always try to introduce the ghost to an equally single male. The male virgin ghost, or the Chong Gak Guishin, is always looking for someone to marry to put their soul to rest. So if you find one virgin ghost, you'd best get to work finding another. Coming in at number 3, I-4 Dead Zone. Interstate 4 is a highway in Florida that spans 132 miles, with it running from Tampa all the way to Daytona Beach. Now, the interstate is frequented daily by folks heading to work and those on their way to Disney World. Now, while it is a popular highway, it is also another nickname for it, the Dead Zone, an area where folks 
motorists need to be particularly careful. This area of the highway has been the location of many accidents, electronic malfunctions, as well as supposed ghost sightings. So why exactly is this spot so dangerous and filled with so much paranormal activity? Well, this is because this quarter mile of highway was built over a gravesite, and as we know from movies, a disturbed gravesite means bad news bears. It means you're in for a nasty surprise. It means you're gonna die. Don't believe it? Well, oddly enough, on the very first day the new interstate was opened, a tractor trailer carrying frozen goods lost control and crashed directly above the disturbed graves of people who had died from yellow fever. It is believed that around 1,500 to 2,000 accidents have occurred on the highway since 1963, which is a lot. And worse still, many of those accidents resulted in death, and between a 24 month period, there were around 44 car accidents, resulting in approximately 65 people being injured. Some locals fear this area of the highway so much that they actually take a much longer route around it. On top of all of this, back in the 1950s, a young boy was said to have disturbed the graves, and the following night he was killed by a drunk driver. And to add insult to injury, the driver was never caught. Coming in at number two, we have the Devil's Chair, also known as the Haunted Chair. This is an urban legend hailing from folklore that is attached to a class of funerary or memorial sculpture common throughout the United States during the 19th century. Now, these chairs were known as the mourning chairs for visitors to cemeteries to sit on when visiting loved ones. However, since then, cemeteries have provided benches for similar purposes. Once the original purpose of these chairs fell out of fashion, superstition quickly developed in association with sitting in the chair. For example, some young people dare one another to visit the site, most often after dark or at midnight, or in some cases on Halloween. Stories state that if you sit in the chair at these specific times, something awful will happen, with people fearing that they will be punished. In Florida specifically, the Devil's Chair is located in Casadega, Florida, and is a graveside bench in the cemetery that borders Casadega as well as Lake Helen. According to legend, an unopened can of beer left on the chair will be empty by morning. Now, in some stories, the can has already been opened. Opened, and in others, the liquid is simply gone through the unopened top. On top of that, it is said that the devil will sometimes appear to anyone bold enough to sit in the chair itself. So, if you do decide to visit the chair at night and take a seat expecting to meet the devil, just be sure to have a beer in hand ready for him because it is said that he will be expecting one, as am I, all the time. I would like a beer. Maybe that's why I'm evil. I'm the devil. And finally, coming in at number one, Legend of the Skunk Ape. Also known as the Swamp Cabbage Man, Swamp Ape, Stink Ape, Florida Bigfoot, and Louisiana Bigfoot, this is a creature that is said to inhabit Florida and is named for its appearance and for its unpleasant odor that is said to accompany it. The ape has supposedly been a part of Florida folklore since the settler period, which is absolutely insane. One of the first reports of the skunk ape in Florida came from the year 1818, when a report spoke of a man sized monkey or ape raiding stores and stores. Fishermen. This became particularly common in the 60s and 70s, with one sighting occurring in 1974, which spoke of a large, foul smelling, hairy ape like creature, which was said to run upright on two legs in the neighborhood of Dade County, Florida. However, some people were skeptical, including investigator Joe Nickel, who stated that these reports may represent a black bear and that other sightings may in fact be hoaxes or misidentification of wildlife. In terms of appearance, the creature is said to resemble the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. However, the skunk Cape is said to be shorter in comparison, has long patches of fur on the shoulders and arm, and is often described as a mottled, rusty red colour, as opposed to the Sasquatch's brown and black coat. In at five, La Siguapa. This is a mythological creature that is commonly described as having human female form with brown or dark blue skin, backward facing feet, and very long, smooth hair that covers the body. According to folklore, it is a hypnotic creature that lurks in the highland mountains and deep forests of the island, waiting for the perfect moment to lure men into the woods and make them disappear. Classic. Some people believe that the Siguapa bring death, and it is said you should not look them in the eye, otherwise, you will be at risk of becoming permanently bewitched. They are considered to be magical beings, beautiful in appearance to some, but horrendous to others. They are deceitful and hell bent on capturing a wayward traveller. Now, some legends suggest that not all are evil and do not wish to kill, though much evidence supports the benevolent claim. Law states that the only way to truly capture a Siguapa is by tracking them at night during a full 
or moon, with a black and white polydactylic dog. The Sagrapa also has a similar one legged version from Colombia called Lapatasolo, who shape shifts into a skull horse head. Lovely. In at 4, El Sombreron. El Sombreron is a famous legend told in books and film, and is also a boogeyman figure throughout Spanish culture. The figure is known by other names like Cepitio, the Goblin, and Sizimite. However, his characteristics are always the same a short man with a black dress, a thick belt, a large black hat, and boots that make a lot of noise when he walks. He is said to ride horses and braid their tails and manes. So sweet, I think. When he cannot find a horse, he will hunt down a dog to braid instead. Now, the legend goes in the in the neighborhood of La Recolosi and lived a woman named Susanna, the daughter of a woman who owned a store. She was known to be pretty with long hair and blue hazelnut eyes. One night when there was a full moon she was on her balcony, admiring the sky when suddenly a short man appeared wearing a big hat and holding a guitar. The girls beauty had amazed him, he sang her a song, however her parents quickly made her come inside. Since that day she had not been able to sleep because she still hears the man with the guitar. She has not been able to eat because when her food is served it is contaminated contaminated with soil. Her worried parents sent the young girl to a priest in order to rid her of the entity. A few days later, El Sobreron disappeared for good. Coming in at number 3, we've got Dreaming of Dead Family. You would think that seeing a dead family member might be nice. You know, maybe they're here to give you some advice or warn you of impending danger, or maybe they're just showing up because they miss you. Aww. However, there's a South Korean urban legend that says dreaming of a dead loved one is bad news. Do your best to resist their lovely charm, alright? It's said that if you dream of a dead family member or friend, they're going to try and steal your soul. They'll call you towards them, and if you head on down and give them a hug, it's game over. This is especially common near water, apparently. If these dreams persist, it's best to look into why they're happening. It's likely that whoever's calling out to you thinks that you owe them something, or you're holding on to one of their belongings. To figure out for sure, people advise heading out to wherever they're buried to pay respects. That should take care of the potentially soul-stealing dreams, and if not, well, I don't know what to tell you. Keep avoiding hugs, I guess. Coming in at number 2, we've got dog-human hybrids. Stories of people hearing disembodied voices while walking alone have been around pretty much forever, but this particular legend explains the mysterious phenomenon in a pretty creepy way. Around the 1970s, all sorts of folks started telling tall tales of finding truly disturbing creatures late at night. While strolling along, they hear a voice. They look up, they look down, they look left, they look right. And nobody's around, so they resume walking, but the voice calls out again. It's talking to them. A little paranoid now, the person checks behind them and looks to see if anyone is leaning out of a window or something. No dice. Then a little dog runs up to them. Oh, what a cute little dog they think. But then it speaks, using language. And the person gets a good look at the four-legged creature and oh god, it's got a human face. Anyone with unsoiled trousers at that point is a champion. These chimeric abominations are apparently quite common in Japanese and Korean folklore. It's said that someone who lives a sinful life will end up reincarnated as a half-dog, half-human monstrosity. Like, it would be cool to live the carefree life of a dog, but definitely not with a human head and intelligence. But considering my sinful modern lifestyle, I'm destined to become a dog man. What's a good name for one of those? And finally at number one, we've got Sesame Seeds. I know what you're thinking. Keegan, you must be losing it. Sesame seeds aren't an urban legend, they're an edible plant byproduct, delicious on bagels and breads. Ah, but you see, I know sesame seeds are real. But there are plenty of legends concerning them in Korea. Remember when I warned all the tripophobes to skedaddle? Well, this is why. There are a few different stories about the ill effects of sesame seeds. One concerns a young woman taking a rejuvenating sesame seed bath. She learns of a lovely new skin treatment where you pour sesame seeds into your bath water. Supposedly this does wonders, leaving you extra youthful and glowing with super clean pores. So the woman decides to give it a try. She fills the tub, tosses in the seeds, and steps into the bath. Her mother, knowing how excited her daughter was to try this treatment, begins to worry after she doesn't come out of the bathroom for an hour. She knocks on the door, but gets no answer. Fearing the worst, the mother forces the door open and stumbles in. Her daughter's unconscious in the tub with sesame seeds stuck on all of her grotesquely open pores. The seeds have taken root in her skin. Oh, yuck. The alternate telling of this tale involves sesame seed skin cream with similar terrifying results. I suppose the pimple popping crowd might find this fascinating, but for most folks, this is hideously upsetting. Usually the victim in this sesame seed disaster is able to have all the seeds removed, but it is a time consuming and painful process. However, leave the seeds too long and you might end up as a human planter. Imagine the roots growing deeper and deeper into your flesh. 
It's kind of like that watermelon seed urban legend where if you swallow a seed, you'll grow one of the bulbous fruits in your stomach. Number five, Slender Man. One of the more recent and yet prevalent urban legends is that of Marble Hornets' elongated Slender Man. The enigmatic figure is depicted as a tall, gangly, thin entity dressed in a suit and tie with fractally ever expanding limbs and a blank, featureless humanoid head. Slender Man first reared that featureless head in internet forums and creepy pasta stories, but gained incredible popularity and took a life beyond the internet. The legend of Slenderman states that it lurks in the shadows, often in backwoods and rural areas, and preys upon unsuspecting people. He's said to have an array of supernatural abilities, manipulating people's minds, controlling their actions subconsciously, can teleport, appear, and disappear at will. Slenderman is synonymous with strange disappearances, leaving behind trails of unsettling clues. Slenderman is a genuine phenomena, transcending the digital realm and seeping into our our real life consciousness and absorbing up our thoughts. I think it's fascinating that in real time we got to watch this thing that started as an internet project turn into a genuine urban legend that will probably be told and retold for future generations. I feel like that's incredible. You see Slender Man in movies, you've seen Slender Man in tons of video games, you've probably seen all kinds of fan art, cosplay, little merchandise. Slender Man has a fandom rivaling most influencers and is probably one of the most popular cryptids in the world and also one of the most infamous. Because there is a very dark turn to Slender Man. When in 2014, two girls in Wisconsin carried out an attack on their classmate to please the entity, saying that they had been influenced by him, blending the lines between fiction and reality a bit too uncomfortably for most people's takes. A stark reminder to not take anything you hear on the internet too seriously. And if you're looking for way more scary stories of cryptids and urban legends, well, you don't need to go anywhere else on YouTube because you're in the perfect place for it. We've got a video or two on just about anything freaky you can think of. Hit that subscribe button, click that little bell so you don't miss a scream, but would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got four more urban legends I am just itching to tell you all about. Number four, the gray man. Coming up next on our list, we're gonna take a quick trip to Europe as we head up to Scotland as we talk about the gray man. Up in the mist shrouded peaks of the Cairngorms, they say there's a spirit out there called the gray man watching over the harsh and treacherous terrain. This spectral entity lurks amidst the craggy slopes and swirling mists, described as a towering figure with an indistinct form. His appearance is shrouded in gray mist that seems to blend with the surrounding landscape, his eyes gleaming with an otherworldly glow, looking just a bit like my black cat walking in the darkness getting caught by a flashlight. Some say the gray man is made up of the mist itself, precipitation given form in the shape of a being mistaken as a man. Many mountaineers and hikers who braved the slopes of Ben McDewey have reported scary happenings that could be proof of the gray man's presence there. Eerily echoing footsteps, an overwhelming sense of dread taking over the pit of your stomach, and some bold expeditioners even claim that they've seen a glimpse of a towering gray humanoid silhouette watching them as they walk over the mountain. The legends warn you that those who are unfortunate enough to cross paths with the gray man will bring unimaginable malfeasance to you and your kin. Should you encounter him, you become disoriented, losing your way to the treacherous slopes or being driven to unspeakable madness from the supernatural powers that he has. Above all else though, what is the gray man? Where did the legend come from? Is it a malevolent spirit haunting those who cross into its territory? A guardian protecting the mountains? Whatever it might be, just be cautious walking through Ben McDewey. And if we have any Scottish viewers who have a bit of insight into the gray man, I found this legend absolutely fascinating and I would love any information you could share with us. In at three, Duende. Duende is a creature from Spanish folklore that has been conceptualized as a mischievous spirit inhabiting a house, often living inside the bedroom walls of young children. They are even known to clip the toenails of unkempt children, often leading to the mistaken removal of an entire toe. Yeah. No fun at all. Now, beliefs about duendes vary from region to region, but some say that they are the souls of infants who died before they could be baptized, whereas others simply portray them as naughty spirits that hide in a person's home and wreak havoc. Duendes became so legendary in Spain that in the 16th century there was even a law that said that anyone who moved into a home, only to later realize it was infested with duendes, were free to abandon it. Yeah. 
That's intense. No matter what, most stories about the duende seem to have a special relationship to children, most likely because parents use them as a tactic to scare their kids into doing things, otherwise the duendes were coming to kidnap them or even eat them if you don't clean your room, eat your dinner, bathe, etc. Coming in at number 2, La Llorona. La Llorona, also known as the weeping woman or the crier, is one of the most famous legends not just in Spanish culture but across the world. This law states that a woman was abandoned by her husband and was left alone to raise her two children. The woman was devastated, so she drowned the boys in a river out of grief and rage. As a result, the woman was condemned to wonder for all eternity until she finds the bodies of her children, often causing death and misfortune to those near her. Now, according to the legend, in a rural village lived a young woman named Maria. She came from a poor family but was known around her village for her beauty. One day, a wealthy nobleman came to the village, who stopped in his tracks when he saw Maria. He proposed to her and she immediately accepted. The two wed and had two sons together. However, the husband was always traveling, and when he came home, he only paid attention to the children. And as time passed, Maria could tell he was falling out of love with her. She was right, because one day he returned to the village with a younger woman and bid his children farewell. Now, this is when Maria drowned her two children in blind rage. However, once she realized what she had done, she searched the river for them, but they had already been swept away. Days later, she was found dead on the river bed, having committed the two ultimate sins, murder and suicide. Her spirit now haunts the land of the living and the dead, weeping for her children, earning the name La Llorona. She kidnaps wandering children at night, mistaking them for her own, while begging the heavens for forgiveness, while drowning the children she kidnaps. Folks who have claimed to have seen her say she appears at night by rivers or lakes, wearing a white or black gown with a veil, and others say that if you hear the cries of La Llorona, you are marked for death. Spooky. It was also a film. I watched it recently. It was utter trash. So, hopefully, the legend's creepier. Finally, coming in at number one, El Coco. The Coco, also known as the Cuco, Coca, or Cuca, is a mythical ghost monster equivalent to the boogeyman found in Hispanophone and Lusophone countries. In Spain, Portugal, and Latin America, the legend goes that parents will often invoke the Coco, or Cuca, as a way of discouraging their children from misbehaving. They sing them lullabies or tell frightening rhymes which warn their children of El Coco. If they misbehave or don't obey, El Coco will come and get them. And and then eat them. Classic. El Coco is a child eater and a kidnapper. It may devour the child immediately and leave no trace, or it may take the child away to a place of no return. However, it only does that to disobedient children. El Coco is known to lurk on rooftops, on the lookout for misbehaving children. It takes the shape of dark shadows and represents the opposite of a guardian angel, with the El Coco frequently compared to the devil. Now, one of the oldest known rhymes about the Coco originated from the 17th century and went like this, I quote, Sleep child, sleep now, or else Coco comes and will eat you. I mean, straight to the point really, I respect that. Now you could easily draw comparisons between El Coco and the Boogeyman, however unlike the Boogeyman, Latino parents use Coco to drive the fear of God into their children. Now another legend has it that El Coco is Francisco Ortega. At the beginning of the 20th century, Ortega was so desperate to find a cure for his tuberculosis that he visited a corandera. He was told to drink the blood of children, so he kidnapped a 7 year old boy named Bernardo. However, I have my doubts about this considering the original Coco rhyme predates the Ortega legend. What do you guys think though? Starting off this countdown, we have Fisher's Ghost. This is a pretty popular urban legend and ghost story in Australia. In fact, they even have a festival for this urban legend. It's called the Festival of Fisher's Ghost, and it's been celebrated since 1956 in Campbelltown. There was even a silent film made in 1924 based on this legend. So it said that on June 17th, 1826, a man named Frederick Fisher, a farmer from Campbelltown, mysteriously disappeared with a trace. His friend, George Worrell, claimed that he had went back to England. He even said that he received a letter from Fisher saying that he wasn't going to be returning to Australia. A couple of months later, a local man said that he saw the ghost of Mr. Fisher sitting on the rail of a nearby bridge. Apparently, the ghost pointed to the creek and then disappeared. After searching the creek, Fred's remains were found and George was arrested for the murder. Obviously, anyone could have guessed that. Now it's said that if you return to the bridge at night, you'll be able to see Fisher's ghostly body sitting on the edge staring into the creek. As a result of this legend, the creek has been named as Fisher's Ghost Creek. 
In our fourth spot, we have the drop bears. Who here is a fan of koalas? Koalas are so cute and are anything but scary, right? Well, yeah, maybe, but their relatives, the drop bear, are definitely not. Legend goes that there are carnivorous predators known as drop bears that closely resemble koalas. It's said that these predators inhabit treetops in Australia. There are just too many stories of tourists getting visually attacked by these creatures. It's also said that they can grow to the size of a leopard and their arms are so powerful that they can just tear their victims into pieces. Now this one is indeed a hoax. Thankfully there are no giant koala type beasts. A lot of people wonder how this legend of the drop bear came to be, but now it's just used as a fun little joke to scare tourists. Number 3. Makola Mabembe Up next on our strange list of urban legends from across the world is going to be that of the cryptid Makolo Mabembe. A cryptid that was totally new to me until this video, so I hope you are finding out about it too at the same time. There are very few things that make me half as happy as finding out about a new cryptid or a new urban legend that I haven't heard about before. Because I read a lot of scary stuff every single day. The Magolo Mabembe is a creature that is said to inhabit the remote regions of the Congo and is said to resemble a large semi-aquatic creature sort of looking like a sauropod dinosaur. That's long neck if you're a Land Before Time fan. One of the really long ones. You probably heard it called as a brontosaurus. It's actually an apatosaurus, not to be too paleontology nerdy on the channel, but you know, it's important to get that out there. It looks like any other number of long necked sauropods is what I'm trying to get across. Looks like a big dinosaur. Luckily, the creature is believed to be herbivorous, feeding on plants and aquatic vegetation. Now, according to local legends, the Makolo Mabembe is said to inhabit the vast network of rivers, swamps, and dense forests of the Congo. Now, this thing's said to be secretive, like most cryptids out there. There's very few camera-friendly cryptids, and it rarely reveals itself to humans. However, unlike many, many stories of cryptids or urban legends on this list or not, the Makolo Mabembe is not hostile. It's not eating people. It's not attacking people. If you find yourself encountering the Makolo Mabembe, it's said that you are blessed with good luck and spiritual protection. I mean, Obviously, you get to meet a dinosaur. That's like the coolest thing ever. Now, in the past, there have been official expeditions hunting for the creature, but it's hard to nail down due to the dense and inhospitable nature of the Congo. Now, much like Top 5 Scary's favorite, the Megalodon, or the Loch Ness Monster, the Makola Mabembe is said to be a long since extinct creature that somehow persisted onwards, or a new species that's eluded classification by science. So, what is it? Is it really out there? I hope I can see it someday and be blessed with a bit of spiritual protection from my favorite long neck. Number 2, Akamanto. Up next at our number 2 spot, and it's a very fitting spot at number 2, and you'll see why in a minute, is Akamanto, also known as the Red Cloak. It manifests as a masked Japanese spirit and may very well be one of the most evil and downright strange creatures of folklore and urban myth you will ever hear about, I promise. The creature is a humanoid spirit with a long flowing red cloak that traditionally has a mask that covers its features. It carries a blade or sometimes a scythe of some kind. Now, there's tons of little local variants in how the Akomanto operates, but there are elements that remain consistent across all tales. First and foremost, the Akamanto's modus operandus. The Akamanto preys on you during your most vulnerable moments. This would-be spiritual assassin comes to slay kings on the porcelain throne. It knocks on the smallest room in the house. This demon comes for you while you're on the toilet. If I can be so blue for a moment, that's why it's the number two spot. That's, there you go, a little third grade humor for you. Speaking of blue, that leads into the deadly game you're forced to play. The Akamanto then offers you a sinister choice. It asks the occupant a question, choosing between either red toilet paper or blue toilet paper. It's kind of like that guy from Squid Games offering you the paper. Actually, this is a little fun top five scary trivia for you. This cryptid is actually what literally inspired that scene in Squid Game. Now, it's a trick question. Neither of these toilet papers that these ghastly spirit has for you are anything like the Royale kittens, okay? The red paper means you will find yourself cut up, leaving behind quite a mess of red. The blue option means you'll be gasping for air, which is clean but slow and painful. This is so funny, but the only way to escape the Akamanto is to tell him that you've got enough toilet paper yourself 
then thanks for asking, but you're good. Really, you just have to ignore him, reject his offer, or flush quick and hightail it out of there. You don't play smart with him, you don't ask for purple paper, or sandpaper, or any wise guy answers, as that's said to lead to the Akamanto dragging you into the underworld. Just as legal as he doesn't flush you. That's amazing. I love so much that this cryptid, you know, you don't have to do any complicated ritual. <laughs> you don't have to have some special weapon to fight him. You just have to tell him, no thanks. <laughs> That's good advice. And number one, La Llorona. Now last time you guys made fun of my pronunciation for this, and I would like to inform you that I'm trying to do it better, but I'm almost certainly still doing it wrong. La Llorona, also known as the Weeping Woman, is a haunting legend deeply rooted in Latin American folklore. Perhaps you've heard her story before, on this channel even. She's rather infamous, told and retold, appearing in countless campfire stories, TV, movies. Her tale has captivated generations, scaring us and fascinating us. It's a cautionary tale warning us of the consequences of disobedience and the dangers of the night. According to the legends, La Llorona was a beautiful woman named Maria who lived in a rural village. She fell in love with a wealthy nobleman and had a family with him. However, the nobleman abandoned her for a younger woman, shattering Maria's heart. Oh, Maria, baby. Nobleman will do that to you. Consumed by grief and anger, Maria drowned her family, except for her husband, in a fit of madness, realizing too late the enormity of her actions. Overwhelmed by guilt and remorse for what she had done, she cast herself into the water and took her own life. But her spirit was denied afterlife, and she was condemned to wander the earth for eternity. She's often described as a spectral figure dressed all in white, her face obscured by either a veil of sorrow or her long, black, wet, soaked hair covering over it. She's said to haunt rivers, lakes, other bodies of water, weeping inconsolably as she searches for her lost family she'll never find. Her cries are bone-chilling, a mournful wail that echoes through the night. And whatever you do, if you hear it, you need to ignore it. You need to avoid it. Do not go bothering her. Legend has it that encountering her is basically a guarantee of misfortune. It's said that she looks out for younger people, mistakes them for her own, and drags them away. Many claim to have seen seen her and heard her cries in the darkness, but if they try to approach, she vanishes. Coming in at number five, we've got Ogo Pogo. Let's start with a famous one. Move over, Nessie. We've got a Canadian sea cryptid to discuss. If you've ever been to British Columbia, you'll know that there are plenty of mountains and lakes to explore. One of the more well-known ones, both for its picturesque qualities and supposed housing of a monster, is Lake Okanagan. Situated in Kelowna, this lake is famous for its vacation-friendly beaches. But if you head out looking for a relaxing day on the water, you might meet up with a strange beast. Sightings of the Ogopogo date back to 1972, but indigenous legends have been telling tales of the creature for much longer. It's described as a long, slender creature with many humps and a horse head that peeks out of the lake during thunderstorms. Sound familiar? While not nearly as famous, Ogopogo is quite similar to Nessie when you get down to it. Both are aquatic, hard to find, and attract all sorts of cryptid hunters. All sorts of folks have claimed to see Ogopogo swimming around, popping its head out of the water from time to time. Photos and videos are common, but none are really verifiable or convincing. Thankfully, the creature seems to be relatively friendly. For all these sightings and rumors, there haven't been too many claims of violence or aggression from the lake-dwelling beast. In fact, it's actually quite well-liked by everyone. In the 90s, the Canadian government commissioned a postage stamp in honor of Ogopogo. Way to go. Skeptics all have their explanations for what it might actually be, with one prevalent idea claiming that it's actually a primitive whale that only comes out during calmer seasons. Regardless of whether it's real or not, what's more fun to say in the end? Nessie or Ogopogo? I'll let you guys decide. Coming in at number four, we've got the University of Toronto Phantom Worker. If a film is being shot in Toronto, you're more than likely gonna catch a glimpse of U of T's campus. The school's buildings are ornate and beautiful, perfect for giving a scholarly feel to any scene. A lot of the buildings have facades that date back to the early 19th century, giving them a timeless feel. Of course, with any buildings that have been around so long, there will be ghost stories. Back in the 1920s, U of T built a gothic memorial to honor students who had died during the First World War. During construction, of this elaborate memorial, many workers were hired to help out. Legend says that one of the workers fell from the tower while polishing the bells, a true hunchback of Notre Dame moment. Ever since that fateful incident, students and faculty alike have claimed to see the ghosts of the worker wandering around campus. Some even claim that there have been ghostly apparitions falling from the tower. Folks who don't know the legend will run to see if the poor fellow is okay, but never find a body. So much for being a good Samaritan. There are many other ghost stories surrounding the university as well, but none so stomach-dropping. Stone with murderous qualities,
Disney's Little Girls Lost in Planetariums and a baker who managed to trap his mistress inside a secret room. The stories are real, but are the ghosts still haunting the campus? I suppose you'll have to pay the institution a visit and find out. Just try not to get roped into paying tuition, all right? That's scarier than any ghost story. Moving on to number three, we have the Princess Theater Ghost. On March 3rd, 1888, an actor named Frederick Federici died suddenly on stage while performing his final scene. Very symbolic. Frederick was playing the role of a demon, and during his descent down through a trapdoor, which was supposed to represent his descent into hell, he suffered a heart attack and died. Now, legend goes that his ghost haunts the theater. In fact, all the cast members said that they saw Frederick on stage with them during their final bows for that show. Since that night, Frederick has been seen all throughout the theater. It's said that he likes to make an appearance on opening nights, and the cast believe that that is a sign of good luck. Coming in at number two, we have the Crown Casino Morgue. If you ever go to Australia, why not go to Crown Casino, the largest casino in Australia? Maybe you could make it big. Well, that's exactly what attracts thousands of individuals to this casino. They all hope that they will be lucky enough to hit the jackpot. However, it's said that there is a morgue underneath this casino. According to this legend, a lot of people take their lives at this casino. Enough so that they needed to create a whole morgue to be able to store all the bodies. Having a morgue underneath the casino was their way to try and conceal the high mortality rate that they face. It's also said that there are trained workers there that deal with the bodies and carry them discreetly off the premise through secret passageways. There's even a related theory that the Yara River is brown in color because of corpses from the casino being dumped into the water there. Although the Crown Casino has denied all these accusations, it's still a pretty creepy legend that some people believe to be true. And in our number one spot, we have Schneider's Alley. In the early 1900s, a man named Dr. Michael Schneider moved into a mansion with his wife and kids. On his large lot of land, the doctor also had a cabin in which he would treat his patients. It's said that his patients normally had schizophrenia or suffered from other mental illnesses. He treated them in his cabin to keep them away from his family. All was going well until his wife and daughters unexpectedly died. This caused him to go mad. Legend goes that after the passing, the doctor started to torture his patients. He would perform surgical experiments on them without anesthesia, and the screams could be heard around the area. Some even say that he would dismember his patients. It's said that he murdered dozens of victims. Legend goes that the area is haunted by the ghost of the mad doctor and his victims. Apparently there have been about 100 ghost sightings in the area but none have been confirmed. If you're brave enough, why don't you take a stroll down this haunted area known as Schneider's Alley or Andrew's Walk and see for yourself. In at number five, we have the Beast of Hackney Marshes. This legend dates back to 1981 when four kids were crossing the marshes on a winter's morning. It is said that they happened upon, I quote, a giant, great, growling, hairy thing. Naturally, people began to assume that this was some kind of hideous monster. It remained a legend going forward, but wasn't spotted again until 2012 when it was captured on camera. Helen Murray, a university student, was out for a stroll near the dense woodland area when she said she was stopped in her tracks by an unknown animal, which she stated was larger than a person and covered in shaggy black fur. I quote, I tried to stay calm as I wasn't sure what kind of animal it was or if it was even alive. I had my phone ready to call 999, then the creature moved. Somehow I managed to take a couple of pictures before I ran. I managed to get away but was scared half to death. Now, she didn't contact the police because she feared they wouldn't believe her. However, the story certainly revived memories of the unexplained sighting that occurred in 81. Officers have stated that they believe neither of these sightings were hoaxes and that two bear carcasses had previously been found nearby in the River Lee. And to this day, it remains a mystery how they even got there. So, were the bears killed by this creature? Were the bears the creature? We don't have bears in England, so... Stumped. In at number four, the killer pool in Epping Forest. Epping Forest is a 2400 hectare area of ancient woodland between Epping in Essex and Forest Gate in Greater London. Over 100 lakes and ponds are found in the forest. However, there is only one that is referred to as the killer or suicide pool. This legend grew rapidly in popularity after Irish author Elliot O'Donnell wrote about it in his book Haunted Britain, stating that there is a pool in Epping Forest that is home to unearthly presences, some miserable and some evil 
evil. Now there is one story about the pool that goes as follows. Around 300 years ago a couple engaged in a forbidden relationship, meeting secretly at the pond in the forest. However, the girls father found out about the relationship and in a fit of anger he killed her at the pool. After learning about his girlfriends death, the lover committed suicide at the very same spot. Following these tragic events, no birds were heard and no animals were ever seen in that area again. The water also became dank, and not dank in a good way, bad dank. On top of that, it is said that people with no inclination went on to commit suicide there, including a woman in 1887 and a young servant, Emma Morgan, who killed herself and her child. Jumping forward to 1959, a competition in a magazine was held to find the exact location of the pool. One writer claimed to know but refused to reveal the details, stating that the place was evil beyond measure. I quote, The suicide pool is deep in the heart of the forest, far from any road. It is dank, evil and malignant, with an atmosphere unpleasant beyond description. It doubt if the sunshine ever penetrates through the surrounding trees. If it did, it would never lighten the black waters. Coming in at number 3, we've got the Nenner look. We've talked about urban legends from the far west coast and the most populous city, so now let's take a trip out east. Known for its quaint, peaceful charm, Newfoundland is the last place you'd expect to find terrifying urban legends, right? I mean, you can get screeched in and end up with a scary hangover and only a faint memory of your previous night, but that's something else entirely. The monster seen near Newfoundland dwells in the sea, but does so unconventionally. How do you think sea monsters usually get around? By swimming, right? Well, this thing acts a little differently than most. First sighted by Sir Humphrey Gilbert back in the 16th century, it was described as a lion-like creature. This fits the description of an Inuit cryptid known as the Nenerluk. Legends of such a creature have been passed down through generations of people, but it was considered just a legend to outsiders until Sir Humphrey Gilbert came across it himself. The Nenerluk is a gigantic beast estimated to be as tall as an iceberg. It's got white fur, huge ears, and loves to eat anything that gets close enough. Seals are the classic meal, but it won't turn down a human if they get close. Now back to that bit about movement. The Nenerluk doesn't swim, it walks along the bottom of the ocean. Yep, not the most efficient way to get around, but it gets the job done. Imagine watching a gigantic beast just walk out of the sea towards you. This is also the reason why people say that it's not really ever seen away from shore. It makes sense considering how deep the ocean is. But if you ever spot a little antenna poking out of the water, it's time to get a move on. And if you ever hear a deafening roar, it's probably too late. Coming in at number two, we've got the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster. We'll return to Toronto for a moment, you know, because of the urban qualities of these legends. Get it? Well, every tunnel system has its fair share of legends, and the Cabbage Town Tunnel is no exception. I'm surprised nobody's gone back and tried to get footage of this strange creature. Back in the 70s, a kitten ran away from home. While searching for his lost feline, a man came across a tunnel in Cabbage Town. Thinking that the kitten might have run in here to hide, he descended down into the abyss. Scanning the darkness for any sign of the little animal, he noticed some motion off to the side. Thinking it might be what he was looking for, the man pointed his flashlight at the movement and saw something he was definitely not expecting, neither cute nor cuddly. He claims to have seen a monkey-like creature with glowing orange eyes standing at half the height of a man covered in grey fur. If that horrible sight wasn't enough, listen to this. The man froze up and kept his light trained on the monster. The monster didn't like this much and told the man in an awful, trembling voice, go away. Go away. And guess what the man did next? He hightailed it out of there and didn't look back. This story made its way around for a while, but nobody ever properly looked into it. That is, until a year later. The man's friend had convinced him to share his story, so he went to the Toronto Sun with the scoop. A reporter accompanied him back to the tunnel, and they both scoured the inside. Looking around, they didn't find any evidence of a monster, but they did discover the remains of a cat. Some speculate that the tunnel leads to a point in the Toronto sewer system, and others have different ideas. Either way, nobody has seen the Cabbage Town sewer monster since. Would you go looking? Finally, at number one, we've got the ghost ship of Northumberland Strait. Heading back east for a moment, let's consider the Northumberland Strait. This is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. It's said that there is a ghost ship that sails upon the strait, more often than not totally engulfed in flame. The legend dates back over 200 years and always seems to play out the same way. Folks on land will look out to see a beautiful schooner with pure white sails. As they look on, these sails will catch fire and the whole ship starts burning. Often people will head out on rescue missions only to find that there was never a ship to begin with. Legend says that the ship will only appear before a northeast wind, predicting a storm. So where does this ghost ship come from and why does it always come back? Well, some people believe that the ship was captained by a pirate who made a deal with the devil. The ship had been fired upon and was burning fast. He wanted his treasure hidden and protected 
accepted, so he signed the pact and sealed his fate. Now he and his crew are doomed to sail forever on this perpetually burning ship. Yikes. Starting us off at number five, we've got the Pied Piper. We all know the legend of the Pied Piper at this point. This legend slash fairy tale dates way back and has different regional variations. Some say that the flautist drew snakes away from a town, others say it was rats. In various versions of the stories, Mr. Pied Piper can be portrayed as generous, greedy, benevolent, or evil. It's all up to the storyteller. However, in Transylvania's version, he was a terrifying hypnotist. See, at some point, there was an abundance of rats in a small German town. The townsfolk didn't know what to do until the Pied Piper showed up. Using his bewitching tunes, he paraded the rats out of town, never to return. He came back to the village, expecting to be lauded as a hero and paid a sum of money, and neither of these things happened. He did his very best to convince the townsfolk that his services were worth their weight in gold, but they never did pay him. This made him quite upset. Leaving the town, he came up with a horrible revenge scheme. The next week, he returned, musical instrument in hand. This time, the goal was not rats or other pests. No, he wanted to lure away the town's children. And so he did, playing a new hypnotizing song that tugged at the hearts and minds of all the kids around. He once again paraded out of town, but this time with their future in tow. By the time all the adults realized what had happened, it was too late. What did the Pied Piper do with these children? Well, there are different theories. A particularly grim idea is that he led them all right off a cliff, like human lemmings. Yikes. Another less terrible one that'll link us to Transylvania is that he led them to a cave in the region and sealed it up. Eventually, the kids did escape and they settled in the Romanian countryside. Some say that's why you can find plenty of blonde-haired, blue-eyed German speakers in the area. Coming in at number four, we've got the Liar's Bridge. Oh, you're all in trouble. I see you down in the comments posting first like 10 comments deep and claiming that you don't like my shirts. I know fraud when I see it. Nobody better try to cross that bridge unless you're down to die. Okay, I'll elaborate. There's a bridge in Sibiu that has quite the reputation. It's said that anyone who lies while crossing it will cause it to collapse. That is serious. This legend has become so popular that many brides-to-be are required to declare their love and purity while crossing it. And if they're being dishonest, well, of course, there's no way that the bridge would still be standing if this were really the case, as people love to lie. However, some have a less dramatic tale to tell, that the bridge will make certain noises upon the delivery of a lie, which could have something to it. The origins of the lying bridge are up in the air, but there are a few different explanations. Some claim that lying or adulterous spouses and fiancés would be tossed off the bridge if their impropriety was discovered. This would definitely explain the modern practices associated with the bridge. Others say that merchants who cheated their customers would be met with the same fate, overcharge or sell something under false pretenses and take a dip. It could also originate with tales of cadets coming to town, wooing local lasses, promising them the world and then disappearing forever. I would say that all these scenarios could result in a bridge famous for ending liars. Would you be willing to take a stroll across the footpath? In at number three, we have the ghost of the Grey Lady and Longleat House. Longleat House is an English stately home and the seat of the Marquis of Bath. The house was originally built by Sir John Tyne and was designed mainly by Robert Smithson after Longleat Priory was destroyed by fire in 1567. It took almost 12 years to complete and is often regarded as one of the finest examples of Elizabethan architecture in Britain. Sounds magical, right? Well, it has a dark side, one of deceit and murder. It all began back in 1733 when Lady Louisa married Viscount Weymouth, who owned the Longleat estate. Louisa moved into the home with him, bringing with her a number of her own servants. It was said that she was fond of one of her footmen, who she described as loyal and true. Now, this favouritism wasn't taken well among the other servants, and out of jealousy, they told Viscount Weymouth that the footman was having an affair with Louisa, which of course wasn't true. Now, this is where the story gets a little blurry. Some say Weymouth paid someone to push the footman down the stairs, while others say he did it himself. Either way, the footman broke his neck, and his body was buried in the cellar. This took a toll on Lady Louisa, who developed pneumonia, which resulted in her death at the young age of 22. According to visitors of Long Longleat House, you can find a lady dressed in grey creeping along the house's corridors, especially close to the library where the footman died. Coming in at number two, we have the Beast of Bodmin Moor. The Beast of Bodmin Moor is a phantom cat purported to live in Cornwall, England. The creature is said to be panther-like and black-furred, with it stalking around Bodmin Moor killing livestock. Sightings of the beast were reported back in 1978, after mutilated slain livestock were found in the area. Some people proposed that the beast had escaped from a zoo, and as it was illegal to own one privately, the former owner could not report it to the police. It has been claimed that animal trainer Mary 
Chipperfield had released three pumas into the wild following the closure of her Plymouth Zoo in 1978, and perhaps this is what gave rise to rumours of the beast. Jumping forward to 1995, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food conducted an official investigation, with there being no verifiable evidence of exotic felines loose in Britain, and that instead the livestock could have been killed by indigenous species. However, less than a week after the government report, a boy was walking by the River Fowey when he discovered a large cat skull, measuring about 4 inches long by 7 inches wide. The skull was lacking its lower jaw, but possessed three sharp prominent canines that suggest it may have been a leopard. It was immediately sent to the Natural History Museum in London for verification, with them determining that it was a genuine skull from a young male leopard. And finally, in at number 1 we have Spring Heeled Jack. Originating from Victoria era Britain, Spring Heeled Jack is a character from urban legend that was first supposedly sighted back in 1837. However, over the years more frequent tales have emerged. His name is said to come from his ability to leap over great distances and heights. Not too shabby. The very first sighting of Spring Hill Jack came in October of 1837, when a woman named Murray Stevens was walking to Lavender Hill when a tall coated man leapt from the building into the street. He then grabbed her with his metal claws and kissed her before tearing at her clothes. After her screams were heard, he fled the scene, leaping back into the building he came from. Following the encounter, more accounts occurred, with the most notable being the Alsop case. The Alsop case was one of the most widespread stories about Jack, with it being published in several newspapers. Jane Alsop recalls the moments when she was attacked, stating, I answered the door of my father's house to a man claiming to be a police officer, who told me to bring a light, claiming, We have caught Spring Heeled Jack here in the lane. I brought the person a candle and noticed that he wore a large cloak. The moment I had handed him the candle, however, he threw off the cloak and presented a most hideous and frightful appearance, vomiting blue and white flame from his mouth while his eyes resembled red balls of fire. She also reported that he wore a large helmet and that his clothing, which appeared tight fitting, resembled white oil skin. No one was ever caught and identified as Spring Heeled Jack, which of course led to numerous theories of his nature and identity. Skeptical investigators have dismissed these stories though and claim Spring Heeled Jack is a product of mass hysteria, which developed around various stories of a boogeyman and devil. Number 5. The Licked Hand this one's got many names. The Licked Hand. I always knew it as humans can lick too. The story goes that a girl is staying home alone on Halloween for the first time, with only the family dog to keep her company. While reading the news, she reads a story of an escaped convict the police are looking for and alert the neighborhood to be on the watch for. Naturally, she's terrified, so she decides the safest thing to do will be to lock herself in the house, lock all the doors, turn all the lights off, and spend the night in bed, letting the stress wash over her. She takes the pup to bed with her for comfort, and she drifts off to sleep, but wakes up in the middle of the night, hearing a loud constant dripping noise coming from the shower. She's scared, since she's the only one in the house and she hasn't used it, but chalking it up to just maybe being a leaky faucet, she tries to get back to sleep, and offers her hand to her dog, letting it lick her hand to calm her down. The next morning, she wakes up and goes to the bathroom to see what happened, and screams when she discovers the body of her dog hanging from the shower. And written in the mirror in dried blood is the phrase, humans can lick too. Classic, absolute classic. It might be Halloween, but we bring you the scares all year round. I'll scare you on Christmas, I don't care. Hit the subscribe button and join us for the best scary stuff on the net at Top 5 Scary. Number 4. Poison Candy. Trick or treat? Well, why not both? This is probably another one of the most recognized urban legends on this list, and inevitably every single October some small town will put out an article about it and people will start to get worried about the fear of someone putting something sinister in your little one's trick or treat goodie bag. This legend has gone back pretty much since trick or treating has been commonplace, but rose to huge mainstream prominence and myth status around the 70s and 80s, where it's now since become an endlessly reshared freaky story that happened to a friend of a friend. All kinds of very on this one pop up, but the most common ones you hear are sadistic pranksters putting razor blades in candy, somehow, or poisoning candy, broken glass, you name it. One very dramatic twist is suggesting that somehow people would poison their kids' candies with illegal narcotics. Something I've always wondered about this particular legend, it always gets passed around, but no one ever stops to question just how much effort this would be. I mean, repackaging the candies, getting them in there. Like, outside of if you went trick or treating at maybe Jigsaw's house, I can't really see this happening. And even then, he usually gives you a pretty decent heads up. He has the little puppet explain the game. Now, despite the long term popularity of this myth, it hasn't actually been proven. Not once. 
A criminology professor from Delaware named Joel Best did a deep dive in 2019 on this phenomenon, studying police reports all the way back to the 1950s and found it remarkably inconclusive, stating that almost every single report of tampered candy comes back to being a hoax or ends up being a cover up for something else. Besides the point though, as evil as putting a razor blade in an apple would be, giving out an apple already on Halloween is already dangerously delusional behavior and that should be considered criminal on its own. Coming in at number 3 we've got Bao Bao. It really does seem that every culture has their own version of the boogeyman. I suppose parents got really fed up with their young children, eh? Something we can all relate to. Bao Bao is exactly that, a Romanian boogeyman. However, I find this figure to be even scarier than lots of the other children snatchers. See, the Bao Bao stays in the same home as the kids. This cloaked figure is believed to appear whenever children misbehave and is always waiting for his chance from a hiding place somewhere in the house. Sometimes it's the broom closet, other times it's the storeroom. Either way, I bet this knowledge scared the daylights out of a bunch of Transylvanian kids. Imagine playing around and coming face to face with the door concealing a mysterious man who will take you away for acting up. With this knowledge, I bet kids were actually quite well behaved. Behaved. Unlike boogeymen in other cultures, the kidnappings also only last for a little while. The Bao Bao will grab disobedient kids and hold on to them for a year. So you don't immediately get turned into soup or drowned in a river, but instead you have to live with this terrifying man for 365 give or take. No friends, no family, no good food, just hard work and a scary supervisor. If anyone did get taken away, it probably scarred them for life. After the year, they get returned home and I'm sure their lives are never the same. Coming in at number two, we've got the ghosts of Teleki Mansion. Here we go, some real Transylvanian ghost stories. The region is known for its beautiful architecture and castles, so there's no surprise that all sorts of ghastly tales are attached to the ornate buildings. Unfortunately, Dracula's castle is Bram Stoker's invention and doesn't really exist. But there are plenty more spooky facades from where that came from. One such tale originates in the Teleki Mansion. This rundown and abandoned building was once an extravagant abode, but these days most locals do their best to avoid it. It's actually relatively close to the university town of Cluj-Napoca, in a smaller town called Okna Mures. Legend says this mansion is haunted by the drunken ghosts of soldiers. During the Second World War, a squad of soldiers broke into the mansion. They'd heard that there was plenty of good wine in the cellars and decided it would be a good night to imbibe. After Locating the gigantic barrels, they had themselves a grand old time. As soldiers tend to do when given downtime with lots of alcohol, they got drunk. A little too drunk, probably. I say this because they ended up goofing around with their guns and firing them inside of the mansion. After causing a mess and a half, one unlucky marksman hit an unintended target. His bullet pierced one of the gigantic barrels, which started to flood the cellar. In all likelihood, a couple of barrels were probably punctured. Gallons and gallons of wine rushed into the underground room, drowning the soldiers before they could escape. I suppose that's as good a way to go as any, drowning in wine. Although I think the soldiers might have enjoyed it a little bit more uh, if it was in their bellies rather than their lungs. And finally at number one, we've got people eating lakes. Sorry to all you Great Lakes swimmers out there, the Transylvanian bodies of water tend to be a little more aggressive than others. Of course they don't actually eat people, but they drown enough experienced swimmers that folks started to claim that they had an appetite. One such lake is Lake Vindrel, which is known for devouring even the most skillful of swimmers. Remember folks, don't eat before going swimming, always have a buddy, and try to avoid voracious waterways. If the disappearances of swimmers wasn't enough, locals have also been known to find bloody chunks of people floating around. That doesn't usually happen when somebody drowns, right? Another lake famous for consuming is Lezer Lake. Apparently this oversized puddle once drowned an entire town. Something gave way, causing the lake to flood in and envelop everything. Neighboring towns thought the church was celebrating something based on all the noise the bells were making, but nope, the bells were ringing because the church was literally descending under the water. So yeah, you better watch your back around those Transylvanian lakes. They'll grab you before you can say backstroke. Coming in at number five, we've got the Lotus Pond. Across all cultures, bodies of water are considered scary in some way or another. Ships have sunk, people have drowned, bad weather is brewed, etc, etc. There's a certain mysticism to water, and we as human beings are fascinated by it. Of course, water on its own can't be scary. We've got to add something else to the mix. How about water plus adultery plus murder? Everyone's got to be afraid of at least one of those things. All classic themes. So here is the tale of the Lotus Pond. One day, a young woman was waiting for her boyfriend by a Lotus Pond. As she waited and waited, she got more impatient. He was making her wait, the bastard. After a while, she decided to look around and see if he had maybe been waiting for her at the wrong spot. During her search, she discovered something quite awful. Her lover was away loving someone else. 
As one might imagine, she did not take this news well. In a fit of sorrow, she threw herself into the lotus pond and drowned. Nobody knows what happened to her boyfriend, but I think it's safe to assume that the next time he walked by the pond, her spirit dragged him into the murky water. These days, it's said that if a couple plans to meet by the lotus pond, they'd better be very careful. The ghost of the girl will call out to any boy nearby, and if he even so much as looks towards the water, he'll be drowned. And that's what you get for even looking, you dirty dog. Now, the Lotus Pond has such a bad reputation that many folks refuse to go near it. And if you do decide that it would be a great spot for a picnic, you'd better bring your horse blinders. If you hear a girl calling out near this pond, don't respond, don't look, hell, don't even turn towards the sounds, unless you really, really like chilling below the water. Coming in at number four, we've got the poor, poor maid. Who's ready for some more adulterous urban legends? So this one's a little more macabre than the jilted pond dweller. This story comes from one of the preeminent Chinese supernatural writers, Gan Bao. Apparently his father was a bit of a womanizer and had maintained a long-running affair with one of the family's maids. This didn't sit well with Gan's mother, who begrudgingly allowed it to happen for years. However, when the father died, she decided to take revenge. The family had a tomb made for Bao's dad, meant to eventually house the mother as well. But when old Daddyo was buried, the mother also had the maid buried with him, alive. That's some hardcore revenge right there, don't you think? For years, the maid remained underground in the tomb, unbeknownst to anyone other than the mother. Then, 10 years after the death of the father, the mother joined him in the afterlife. Gan Bao had the tomb opened up so they could place her body there as well and came across an unpleasant surprise. Firstly, he never knew that his mother had the maid buried alive, so there's that little shock to start us off. But amazingly, she was still alive. Emaciated and weak for sure, but alive nonetheless. She was nursed back to relative health and questioned about her survival tactics. Had she been crawling out for sustenance and then returning to the tomb out of some self-flagellating guilt? Had she foraged for grubs and wastewater? In the end, the only explanation she could give was that the ghost of the father had brought her all she needed to survive for years. I suppose he felt bad that his wife had punished this young worker in such a horrible way. Nobody has seen any ghosts walking around with food and water near the tomb since, but folks definitely keep an eye out just in case. Number three, clowns. Please tell me you remember this one. Th this was like an, uh, a real problem for a hot minute. 2016 was the first sign things were getting very weird. For a while, we were experiencing a record-breaking case of scary clown fever. Between Pennywise terrifying us from ever going near a sewer grate, Jared Leto terrifying us from ever going back to the movies, we were all on edge when it came to rainbow wigs and big shoes. And recent polls of Americans have showed that almost 40% of all Americans say they have a deep fear of clowns. It's understandable. Between the movies and the constant urban myths, clowns get a very bad rap. While North America was coming down bad with chlorophobia, we just could not stop seeing evil clowns everywhere. It became a trend, or plague, maybe more fitting, of people dressing up as their favorite terrifying clowns and just standing around the neighborhood haunting and scaring anybody who passed them by. Naturally, this made it rife for urban legendary. All manner of stories came out of these sinister clowns abducting people, attacking people, and some truly dark legends saying these clowns were stalking their prey, but we don't know how many of these were actually true. You know, some people even wondered if there was a, a conspiracy going on involving a shadowy cabal of, of scary clowns working in tandem to scare people, presumably all driving around in the same little car that fit 30 of them. So what was it? Was it all just viral marketing for a horror movie? A lot of people assumed it had something to do with it, although the studios vehemently denied any connection. It eventually scared people so much that in the United States, some companies like Target stopped selling clown costumes and paraphernalia altogether. Some neighborhoods even instituted bans on clown costumes. Really, actually, they banned clowns, like the town from Footloose band dancing. In the end, like all trends, it faded off, but that doesn't mean it won't still be in our memories for a long, long time. Number two, The Bunny Man. Now, I've always been a huge fan of the slasher movies. Michael Myers, Ghostface, Voorhees, there, there's just something really cool about a big terrifying lunatic running around with a mask and a blade. It's kind of cool because it's the thing that only exists in movies, you know? It's not a real life thing, right? <laughs> well, Enter the Bunny Man, a real life horror story straight out of your worst B movie nightmares. The first reported sighting of the Bunny Man was on October 19th, 1970 right before All Hallows Eve. A young couple, an Air Force cadet, one Robert Bennett and his young wife, were visiting family in Burke, Virginia. They drove down to Guinea Road in Burke, and at around midnight, the couple pulled their car to the side of the road. They say it was to visit an uncle who lived across the street, but I'll just say, yeah, I'm sure that's why you parked on the street in the middle of nowhere at midnight, but that's neither here nor there. What's there is that while the two were sitting in the car, presumably discussing politics and working hard, they heard crashing noises and noticed the front window had been smashed, and on the seats 
Gates lay a hatchet. They saw something walking towards them, a man wearing all white with long white ears, screaming at them that they were on private property. The couple hoofed it, naturally, and told police exactly what they saw. A tall man in a bunny mask with a hatchet. Now sadly for all of our sleep schedules, this wouldn't be the last time anyone saw the bunny man. Not even two weeks later, a security guard, one Paul Phillips, was walking home at night down Guinea Road, where he saw an odd man wearing a bunny mask and a suit sitting on an unfinished porch. The security guard, braver than I would have been, approached the man to see if he needed some help. The bunny man then drew the hatchet he had hidden and began wildly slashing the porch, screaming at Phillips that if he didn't leave, he'd chop his head right off. Now those two sightings back to back were the most widely documented bunny man sightings reported to the police and are most likely actually real. From then on though, the townsfolk of Burke, Virginia, the bunny man would become an urban myth. Sightings and stories would pass around with all manner of sinister details getting added to Bunny Man's legacy. The truth is, the Bunny Man was never found. And to this day, no one knows who he was, what his deal was, or what manner of darkness he was hiding behind those big floppy ears. And number one, the decoration. Who doesn't love a haunted house? Nothing like wandering through the dark and having a bored, slightly sadistic teen jump out at you with a scary mask. Sometimes they're pretty scary, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes they're pretty corny, you know? Plastic skeletons and rubber bats aren't that terrifying, right? Well, in 1976, a production crew was filming an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man set in a carnival, and they needed a haunted house background to shoot with, so they went to New Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach. The crew began readjusting the decorations to accommodate all of their equipment, and the team wanted to take take down a hanging mummy prop that was blocking a shot. And while the team was moving what they thought to be nothing more than cheap plastic and paper mache, they broke the arm of the dummy and then revealed the human bones inside of it. Yeah. Turns out the dummy mummy was a real embalmed human body. How no one noticed that is beyond me. But just think of that for a second. How many people do you think walked through that exact haunted house without knowing that cheesy little mummy was a real body hanging there with them? 